Let's talk about animals and what they have in common with humans. And we have the perfect person here, Franz de Bal. Thank you so much for joining Aprendemos Juntos. You're welcome. What made you choose ethology, uh, social psychology, and, and what impact those disciplines end up having in the way you see the world? Well, I'm an animal lover. From very young, I had animals, usually aquatic animals. I lived in the Netherlands. Uh, cats, birds, all sorts of animals. And so I wanted to work with animals, that was sure. And I studied biology. So my work with the primates is sort of secondary. That, that's a later choice that I made, but um, I do want to work with animals. And I've always felt very close to them. I, like you know, there's many people who feel close to animals. Many, certainly many children do. And uh, so for me, it was sort of natural progression into biology. You mentioned primates, and I think it's an easy thing that happens when, when we look at primates and feel like, wow, we're very similar. But I'm sure you studying them can explain what is relevant about those similarities. Yeah, it's, it's not just that we're similar, we are primates. So, so people forget that sometimes, they are animals and they are primates. We may be very smart primates, but we are primates. And so um, I, I think the human psychology uh, so socio-emotionally, we are primate. We are not very different from a chimpanzee or a bonobo. Intellectually, we are maybe somewhat different, and, and certainly we have language, which is very special. But um, the way we react, like loving, hating, being jealous, uh, having attachments, all these things are very similar to what you see in the primates. One thing that we can observe with uh, the way, for example, primates uh, face danger is cooperation mm -hmm. and how that can be important for saving their lives. What can we learn about, about that behavior? Well, I think it's important to, because 50 years ago or 40 years ago, people would only talk about aggression and competition and dominance in the primates. So they had a sort of very negative view. Now we look more at the cooperation and the empathy and the altruism that you sometimes see in them. So, so I think, um, Many animals survive by cooperation. It's true for dolphins, elephants, wolves, including, and also the primates. So many animals survive by cooperation, so they depend on each other, which means that they need to take care of each other to some degree. They need to resolve conflicts between, among themselves. And so I'm very interested in how they do that, how they resolve conflicts. So that's all essential for their survival. Because on their own, they cannot, uh, you know, there, there are periods in the life of primates, for example, when they move between groups from one group to where they were born to another group. In those periods that they are alone, they don't survive very well. They need companions and they need help and they need alarm calls and they, they need supporters in order to survive. How does that work, that cooperation? Well, the helping can range from uh, most extreme is, for example, when a chimpanzee is attacked by a leopard in the forest. It's a very dangerous predator. Uh, others will come over and help chase off the leopard, which is a very dangerous thing for them to do. But uh, other help is much simpler. Like, let's say someone is injured and, and others have to slow down and, because they cannot keep up with their travel. They all travel uh, through the forest. Or you may have um, a, mo a mother who, uh, for whom the children are too heavy and so somebody else may help. Uh, carry the children. So there's all, all sorts of ways of helping or licking the wounds of someone or uh, babysitting for someone, uh, um, helping someone politically because among the males there's a lot of politics going on and usually the alpha male is not alpha male on his own, he has supporters and so uh, he has then a friend or maybe certain females who help him keep his position and so they support him in fights with others. Tell us a little bit about that figure, the, the alpha male, the alpha female, and on some uh, primate colonies, uh, you see those elements of leadership that are... Yeah. Uh, how that works? Who decides who is the, the leader or how they accept someone? Yeah, so the, the alpha male is decided by coalitions. That's why it's a political process. So, so in, in some animals, let, let's say chickens, you have a pecking order, and the biggest and meanest chicken is gonna be the boss. In chimpanzees, it doesn't work that way. So the, 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 the alpha male needs supporters because he's not doing it on his own. And that's also why sometimes the smallest male can be the alpha male because he has the best supporters. Now the support is mostly other males, but sometimes it's also females. 
and um, they help him uh, challenge the established alpha male. And so then you, you get sometimes fights, but physical fights are actually not so common, but it's certainly confrontations between them. So that's the, the alpha male is a combination of physical strengths, so they need to be healthy males, but also a political process. The females is a very different business. So you have alpha females also in a primate group. Every primate group has an alpha female. Um, age is actually a, a, a plus for females. So it's not a plus for males. When males get older, they get kicked out of their position by younger males. But uh, females can be alpha for a very long time because age is a, is a positive thing for them. And so uh, I described, for example, Mama, the alpha female of a chimpanzee colony who was alpha female for 40 years. Um, and she was 59 years old when she died. So she could barely walk anymore. She was almost blind, but she was still the alpha female of the group. That's not possible for a male. A male would be kicked out long before that. You mentioned Mama, and I think in the history of ethology, that moment, that re-encounter she had, uh, this chimpanzee had with, uh, with the biologist um, jo uh, Jan van Hoff, yeah. when it was the last time they saw each other, she was really ill, mm -hmm. and she was not even recognizing him at first, but the moment he, she does, it's beautiful. It, it's so much emotion there. Uh -huh. Tell us more about that story. Yeah, so that's... Uh, she was dying and, and she was isolated from the group at that point um, because she was in, in a night cage. And normally we never go in into a cage with a, an adult chimpanzee. And, uh, adult chimpanzees are much stronger than we are. So adult males are considered five times stronger than the human male and females three and a half times stronger. So, so you don't go in with a chimpanzee, with an adult chimpanzee. But because she was dying, and Jan van Hoof, the professor, knew her for 40 years, he knew her for a long time, he, he went in with her. And so at some point they embraced, and they touched each other, and they embraced, and you see that Mama is actually calming him down. I think Mama was called Mama because she was a very maternal figure, and uh, I think she may have noticed that the professor was very nervous coming into her cage and she calmed him down and you see that movement. Now, what I find interesting about that whole encounter is that people were very moved seeing it, uh, emotionally moved. And I could understand that. But people were also very surprised. They were surprised how human-like the expression of a chimpanzee is, facial expression and hand gestures. And, and that, I found strange, and, and that's why I've termed my book Mama's Last Hug, because we have said for 50 years that chimpanzees are our closest relatives. So why are people surprised that their expressions, their faces, are very much similar to ours? They have the same muscles in their face. Their face communicates emotions, like in us. Very much the same sort of emotions that they have as we do. And so uh, I was a bit surprised that people were surprised that it was so similar because um, the emotional life of a chimpanzee is very similar to ours. Those emotions uh, is something that you, you work on. And, and for example, in, in the past decades, we were considering emotions on animals that were closer to humans. But you recently started seeing emotions on all animals, including non-vertebrates like yeah. octopuses, lobsters. Why is that, um, that, that concept, the emotion, important? And, and also, what can we learn from it? Yeah, the strange thing is that uh, when I was a student, we were not allowed to talk about emotions in animals. So, so Darwin, much earlier in the 19th century, he did talk about the emotions of animals. Then we got a period of about one century where the behaviorists like Skinner and so people like that, they, they said, no, animals are more like machines, very Cartesian. Animals are more like machines. We don't talk about emotions, we don't talk about consciousness, we don't talk about thinking, uh, none of that. And now we are back to a time that we talk about the emotions. And of course, with animals like the primates who have the same facial expressions, it's very easy to make these comparisons and to say, well, they have this emotion and that emotion. Uh, but at the moment, we're also talking about fish having emotions and bees and ants and yeah, invertebrates also. And so the, um, the sentience of animals, sentience meaning do they have experiences, inner experiences, uh, is now being recognized for lots of species. And, and it has, of course, ethical consequences because people don't always realize that. But if you talk about 
the feelings of a lobster, so to speak. Maybe you need to take that into account when you kill a lobster. So, so it has ethical consequences and it's a big point of debate at the moment. Well, you were even controversial when you started talking about those emotions in, in animals and, and not only that, also empathy. Yeah. It's a concept that it has to do like <laughs> boiling a lobster. The, mm -hmm. we, we could even feel things. You're yeah. describing a chimpanzee calming a human. That Those yeah. things, empathy, uh, for example, is it on our DNA or is something that we learn or, or culturally start to embrace it? Well, well we, we are born with empathy. All mammals have empathy in the sense that they are sensitive to the emotions of others and they are affected by the emotions of others. Now, there was a time that psychologists did not want to talk about animal empathy because they had a very high level definition of empathy. They thought empathy is that you imagine how someone feels. Empathy is that you imagine their situation, which is very complex. And, and I don't think uh, many animals do that. But many animals are very sensitive to emotions. So your dog is sensitive to your emotions. And, and there's actually experiments that show that dogs, if you are crying, uh, the dog will come up to you and lick your face or put the head in, in your lap. And so many animals have that kind of empathy. And in chimpanzees and bonobos, it's very common what we call consolation behavior. Someone is distressed and is crying and others come over and embrace them and calm them down. That's also an act of empathy. And so empathy, we think, exists in all the mammals. There are now also some studies in birds at, at the moment. So uh, empathy is very widespread. And we think it started in evolution with maternal care. So whether you're a mouse or an elephant, if you have babies, you need to react to their emotions when they're cold or when they're hungry. So females need to do that. That's also why oxytocin, which is a, a maternal hormone to some degree, uh, oxytocin is involved in empathy. Why females have more empathy than males in general. Uh, this is true for many species, including the human species. And so uh, empathy is a, is a biological characteristic. Yeah. You mentioned the difference between males and females. That also appears on your uh, most recent book. And how is that uh, something that we can look back and see in our primate ancestors? And, and how the, the di those differences between male and female are biological or is something that uh, is more cultural? Yeah, it's, it's very hard, hard to tease that apart. So there, there are some biological differences in behavior, for example. For example, the play behavior of young females in primates is very much directed to babies and dolls. If you give them dolls, they will play with dolls. In the wild, they actually make dolls out of wooden logs and, and they carry them on their back or on their belly. So the play behavior, you see sex differences. In aggressive behavior, you see, for example, males are more physically violent than females in many species. So, so you see these differences, but they're always subject to culture also. So, so you can always transform them because we are cultural beings. And so we always have an ability, for example, to reduce aggressiveness or to enhance aggressiveness, whatever we want in our culture. So, so that distinction between is it biological or cultural is very hard to make. Uh, but there are certain things that are uh, universal. So, so for example, I mentioned physical violence. In all human societies, you look at the murder statistics, you see more males doing it than females. And so that's, that's a characteristic that we share with other primates, is, is that males are more physically violent. That doesn't mean that you cannot manipulate that culturally. You, you can reduce it or enhance it, um, but there is a biological element to it. So what happens when certain communities are led by females or led by men? It makes me think about history, about leaders and humans, yeah. but also we could go to bonobos that you mentioned yeah. earlier and how they are led by matriarchs, by strong female figures. Yeah. Uh, how is that society and, and what are the characteristics of those leaders in that case? Yeah, people sometimes think that leadership is more natural to males than females. I, I don't agree with that, because in all the primate groups we see alpha females. There's, there's always a high-ranking female, and they're sometimes very powerful. And so um, I think we need to make a distinction between physical dominance and political power. In terms of physical dominance, males are, are bigger and stronger. So, so that's an easy one. Um, but for example, Mama, the chimpanzee, who lives in a society that is male-dominated, because chimpanzees are male-dominated, she was very powerful and very central. 
and she was at, at least equally powerful politically as the oldest male of the group. And those two, the oldest male and Mama, they were the one, the ones who decided everything. Now bonobos are different because bonobos, they are female dominated. So we have two close relatives. One is male dominated, chimpanzee. The other one is the bonobo, where the females are dominant. The females are not physically dominant. They, they're smaller than the males. But collectively, they have a very strong sisterhood. They support each other. And collectively, they have taken the dominance from the males. And, and still, it's, uh, I must say that these hierarchies, social hierarchies, uh, in, in all species, they are segregated. You have a male hierarchy. You have a female hierarchy. Uh, and the males worry about their position among the males. And the females worry about their position among the females. What happens between the sexes is actually quite different. There's not a lot of competition between the sexes. Also in human society, I would say, most of the competition is within the genders, not between the genders. And so um, people often have remarks about, is it natural for males to be dominant over females or not? It's not a simple question, and it's actually not a very relevant question, because I think the, the lives of, of males and females are often quite segregate. In, in your book, uh, Good Nature, you point out something that people tend to do, which is see violence on primates as something innate, uh, something instinctive. I don't know if humans are we naturally violent. What is the role of culture or biology to define those violent moments? Well, we, we humans have a tendency that as soon as we do something bad, like violence, we we compare it with animals, and so we say we're acting like animals. And when we do good things, when we are nice to each other and altruistic, then we consider that humane. That's, that's something that we take for ourselves. And the comparison with animals, we don't talk so much about. But I think both sides, positive behavior and nice behavior and aggressive and competitive behavior, both sides come from our primate background, and we can do both. We're not always nice and we're not always aggressive. So, so I think that whole spectrum of behavior we can see in other species. And then we have two close relatives where in chimpanzees violence is actually quite common. In bonobos it's very unusual. They're very peaceful and, and, and sexy creatures who, who, who keep the peace in their group. And, and so we have that whole spectrum in our relatives also. And I guess that certain circumstances might push certain behaviors. And one thing that is interesting on, on modern days is how we are constantly having access to, to videos. And, and animal videos, for some reason, are one of the most popular things people need to watch. And we can observe, yeah. even if we're not doing research, we are observing. For example, I was recently seeing one where a bear enters a cage outside where there are two big pigs. And suddenly, oh, yeah, I saw you've that seen that one. Yeah. And suddenly they, they, they react and you're like, wow, if you have to bet in this fight, you would bet for the bear, but what is happening there? And, and those uh, instincts and, and, and violence and, and cooperation, all those elements that are on, on that nature yeah. play. For us, it's very interesting that we have these videos because it used to be in our field of animal behavior, especially people who go to the field and come back with a story, we would say, oh, that's just an anecdote. You're just telling a little story. And who knows, it may be true or it may not be true, we don't know. Nowadays, everyone has a video camera because we all have telephones. So everyone has a, t has a video camera. And so the, the people now film these things, which makes it much more convincing. If I come back from the field and I say, I I'm not saying just what I saw, I show you what I saw it becomes much more convincing. And so the videos have really helped us. Normally, most interactions we have uh, are with pets. For example, mm -hmm. most people would have experienced what it is uh, when, when a dog accidentally bites their human companion and then feels terrible about mm -hmm. it. Um, what is the management of emotions animals have? Yeah, so, the, so there's actually a, a, a debate about whether dogs feel guilt or not guilt, because you mentioned that. Um, uh, I think dogs anticipate punishment. So, so when you come home and the dog has done something bad and, and he hides under the table, um, people think that the dog feels guilty, but I'm, I'm not sure. The dog also uh, anticipates that he's in trouble. 
And, and, but, but you know, the difference between feeling guilty and knowing that you're in trouble is not so great also in adult humans. There's many uh, politicians, for example, who don't show a lot of guilt feelings unless they get caught. Uh, and so the humans are a bit like that too. We are humans very obvious, for example, when, when we're scared, afraid, and our facial expressions mm -hmm. can react towards that. Yeah. What about animals? Are they, are they managing their emotions differently or, or...? It's interesting, in humans, for example, when you're afraid, we say you have cold feet. And actually there's a, there's a team that has tested that and has put people in scary situations like with scorpions or in, in airplanes that turn around like this. And yes, the, the temperature of your feet goes, goes down. So, so you do get cold feet when you're scared. Uh, if you test rats on fear, you, so you, you, you give them the odor of a cat, for example, which is fearful for them, um, their feet will get cold and their tail will get cold. And what happens in fear is that during fear, uh, your blood from your extremities is withdrawn because it's used for action, like running or hiding. And, and so the fear response of all the mammals is basically the same physiologically and also probably uh, uh, neurologically because the amygdala is involved in it. And so the, the fear response, which is probably the oldest emotional response because fear is a very important emotion uh, that you see in all animals, uh, is very similar across the board. And do you observe certain characteristics that we can learn and look back and analyze and how biology, uh, primatology can help us maybe be a little more <clears throat> compassionate or, or mitigate our way of dealing with conflict? Yeah, I'm not sure that I can give primatological advice for how you should manage your life. But uh, it is true that, for example, reconciliation is a very common process in the primates. So, so after a fight, uh, chimpanzees will kiss and embrace each other and, and repair the relationship, and then they groom each other. Uh, and, and bonobos, they will do it sexually. They will get together sexually after a fight. And so all the animals, actually, people have studied this in many species, um, they have ways of repairing relationships. And that shows how important the, the social relationships are for them. So fights are impossible to avoid. It's a bit like in a, in a large family. I'm from a large family. In a large family, there are many fights and many reconciliations. It, it has to happen because otherwise this thing will fall, fall apart. What are the anecdotes that you sometimes work with that you know that people make them hmm, think? Well, the, the response to death is interesting because First of all, many animals who have attachments, who attach to, to each other or to humans, they respond to the deaths. So for example, a dog may, may sit on the grave of, of his master for, for the rest of their life, you know, that happens. Um, and uh, as soon as there's attachment, there's also loss if someone dies. And chimpanzees, for example, if, if a chimpanzee dies in, in a colony of chimps, uh, they will not eat for a couple of days and they will be completely silent, which is very unusual for chimpanzees, for a couple of days. And they're very affected by it. Uh, we have also had a case recently, uh, it was a female who had a stillbirth. So, so she was pregnant, uh, then she had a stillbirth. And, and it was interesting because all the rest of the chimpanzees, they embraced her and they kissed her and they stayed with her. And they showed that behavior for almost a month they were, they were very careful with her and very friendly with her. So it was almost as if they knew that something terrible happened, that they knew about the stillbirth and, and responded to it. So yeah, they're very sensitive to these things. So, so I think many animals, including elephants and, and the apes and dolphins and so on, they understand the death of somebody else. Uh, and they know it's an irreversible change and that's why they react so strongly to it. It's very normal that kids love animals and sometimes there's a progression like normally the cat and the dog the farm animals and then they go to dinosaurs but there's always fascination in our young days for animals that maybe we lose along the way i would say half the people lose it so so all kids i've never met met kids who don't like animals or are not interested in animals they, they sleep with stuffed animals and i think all kids look at animals and themselves as sort of equals they don't have an opinion like that they are superior to a dog or a horse. No, no, they're not superior. 
Then when kids reach puberty, they get indoctrinated by society that they are human. They, they are different. Animals are not human, we are human. So they get indoctrinated that they are, they are different. Uh, I think half of them believe that and become people who don't care about animals and uh, couldn't worry less. And, and, and a lot of people, like I meet them constantly when I visit, for example, zoo caretakers or scientists who work with animals, a lot of people keep that interest in animals and don't necessarily consider themselves superior. It's dangerous because it sets human, humans apart from nature. Like here we are, have humans, we are the masters of the universe, and there you have nature. It has done a lot of damage. If you look at the climate crisis and the COVID crisis, they come from that attitude that we are not part of nature, that we're sort of outside. We can do whatever we want with the world. We can spoil the oceans, we can uh, pollute, pollute the environment, we can kill animals massively, exterminate animals. That's all fine because we are the boss of the universe. And, and that attitude is coming back to bite us. We now have the climate crisis as a result. Uh, with the COVID crisis, the same thing. You, you, you can eat whatever you want. You eat bats, it's going to be fine. The, the COVID crisis is just a small virus that has sort of paralyzed the whole world economy. And uh, it shows again, we, we are animals among other animals. And I think that attitude that people have, that they are separate from nature, and that there's something else than an animal, is, is actually a destructive attitude. And the philosophers will need to change their tune on that. And, and of course, many of them do. Many philosophers at this moment are writing about the human-animal connection and, and where we are uh, relative to the rest of nature. So there's many philosophers now interested in that issue. I guess that we could all do that exercise and be a little more humble. And, and, and maybe talking about education, yeah. uh, when you incorporate animals and, and behaviors with kids and us as adults in a way of learning, it could be a... Yeah. There's a strong desire in humans to set themselves apart and to say, only we can do this, only we do that. It's true, humans are special animals, but you know, elephants are special animals too. And so <laughs> I'm not convinced that we are that special. And uh, I consider humans basically animals. And, and we have been very successful, uh, although we're not necessarily the dominant species. You know, recently there was a count of ants. How many ants are there in the world? And I think they came up with 24 quadrillion ants. Meaning that there are probably more, there are certainly more ants than humans in the world. But in terms of biomass, ants are maybe more important than humans in this world. Uh, worms is another one that we have many more worms in the world uh, and, and a bigger biomass than humans. And so humans are a dominant force at the moment in the world. But if you remove humans tomorrow, if you remove all of them from Earth, nature will just continue and um, a million years from now you won't even know that there were humans. Uh, all the evidence will have disappeared at that point. I'm sure that uh, we, could, we could be better people if we connect better with everything that is around us. Uh -huh. And we thank you so much, Franz de Waal, for your, for your time and, and making this very, very attractive to, to keep digging our field. Thank you. <laughs>